the seeming um, urgency to address and deal with some of the topic matters, even though some of what we are seeking to present, we want to be able to present it in a more presentable way, but some of the basic knowledge has to has to be disseminated and has to be um, um, put out there, basically. You know, it has to be disseminated. I think that's the proper word. It has to be disseminating means sowing the seeds. It's the sower went forth to sow. And as we are sowing the seed, the, the good news of the King of Kings and his Christ, just as the Moshia, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos, as he has said, some, uh, some falls on different type of, of, of ground. And we learn that this, this ground is not just pointing at other people, but it depends on what our particular consciousness is. Now, this day is November, let's put this up here, November 11th, 2011. And this is also the eve of the Sabbath, right? And as is our habit and custom, or as is telemeda, telemeda or Talmud, or our our practice, it is the Sabbatical or Rastafari Sabbatical study or Torah portion. And this particular Torah portion is known in the Hebrew as Y Yera, Y Yera, or some say Vai Yera. Now Bamarinya is called Tegale Tele Te or Te Galet. This is one way of writing it, and it's in our Torah portion guide. Now this is 11, 11, 11, and as we touched on in, in our about think, three or so parts, some of the basics concerning 11, 11, 11 for, for us from the Rastafari and from the elect Ethiopian Hebraic perspective, and we touched on it by touching on the song and the daily song, as well as reminding ones and ones of some of the documents, the new documents that we have available, such as the Mesmore Dawit, or the Amharic Psalms of David, along with the King James Version, and this is in a, a particular parallel, what we call a parallel Bible version, and it's available at our, at our book site on the, on the web, uh, www.loj society.org and we will highly recommend that ones invest in getting a copy of this for themselves. There's a lot of valuable and key notes seeing that the Psalms and chanting a Psalm and, and the Psalm is a very important part of our for lack of a better word daily devotionals, what's called devotionals. But being a devotee of Rastafari is nothing to be ashamed of. So get a copy of this, and we've touched on this in the previous video. Now, what we would like to address and, 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 and touch on briefly, even before we get in this particular sabbatical portion and, and, and Shabbat Shalom, uh, Shabbat uh, Salam, Senbet Salam, Shalom Rastafari, to the one in the sun and to all. So Shabbat Shalom, Senbet Salam. Today's Torah portion, reading and feeding. What is it and what is the relevancy of this particular Torah portion to the times? to the times that we're in. Now, this is not to go about and, and just seek for a sign. And, and let us make this, make this very clear, make no mistake about it. It's not to say, oh, there's a sign and there's a sign, because our master in medicine says that um, the children of disobedience seek for a sign. We should recognize 
these particular, these and those particular signs, but not seeking for a sign to verify or to affirm our faith or faithfulness. But what is this really about? What is this really about, and how can we uh, touch on this particular point? There's a lot that's in mind, and let us follow the the, the spirit. Let's first touch on the basics of this particular um, Torah portion, just to get a basic groundation. As we said, it's um, um, Vayera, and it's spelled variously. Some spell it V-A-Y-E-I-R-A, Vayera. Um, and if you were to look at the Hebrew, and just to give uh, a particular um Hebrew of it, if you look at the Hebrew, you have the Yod, right? I mean, the, the We, the Vav, the Wow, the Huawei. This is the W. Then you have the Yod. Then you have the, the Ris or the Res, the Res, or some say the Resh or the Rosh. And then you have the Aleph, the Aleph. So if you look at it, it would be um, like this, of course, read this way, W-Y-R-A. Now, with the modern uh, Judaic or fourth Hebrew, they have the, the various uh, um, um, vowel points, um, we, ye, ra, a, we, ye, ra, we, ye, ra, or we say, why ye, ra, why ye, ra based on that Ethiopic, using the Ethiopic as that key, key for us in order to properly repoint the Hebrew correctly. And this is one reason why the OJs or the other Jews have certain difficulty um, amongst them in ascribing both meanings to some, some key uh, Hebraic words and terminology because the meanings or the roots of the Hebrew are found in the Ethiopic grammar. And this is another text as well. These are all texts that are intended to form the basis of our New Age educational system. And so we could either build a structure first, like a, a building or a campus, or we can first build the curriculum and build the teaching and and and, and, and produce the, the documentation so even without a physical structure, brothers and sisters with discipline and discipleship can study and show themselves approved. So whether there is a, a physical building or location, you know, like Bible studies, like church, we don't need a physical building and put a sign and call it church because the early churches met within the, the homes and the families when ones came together around what's known in Ethiopia as a, as a meso. And, and the meso, you can say, is the communion table where the injera, you understand, which is our daily bread, is put along with the wet and the goldman and, and the other um, food, which is part of that communion. And we would come together around that. That's where we get the word neighbor from or vale injera, one who has or shares their injera. Now, there's a spiritual level of interpretation, and a sister had actually had asked this question that's been on my mind. Um, I don't remember exactly the, her, her um, avatar or her, her sign-on name, the particular name that she uses fully. I know something... Sister Miss Something Jamaica, and excuse me for not, because, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, ways one can tweak their particular name. But we did respond to the sister, um, and her question, or she has some questions concerning, she said some of what we were teaching or what she was getting out of it, there was some confusion were we saying that not to look at it literally or to look at it metaphysically or spiritually, the first interpretation is, is the basic common sense based on the knowledge and evidence. Even if we don't know too much about the, the contextualization at first, we have to 
judge what we are presented and put it down and own what we believe or think this is to mean. And then as we grow in our studies, as we begin to grow in our learning, we might have to tweak and redefine exactly what the so-called literal or historical interpretation is. Now, once we get the most accurate um, historical, quote, end quote, or mythological, see, when we say the myth, we're saying what Christ said as parables, what's known as parables or was known as parables, even in the Bible, are proverbs in the Old Testament. So your New Testament parables are your Old Testament proverbs. And if we now put that in the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian context, that's what you'll call the, the mysteries or the so-called Egyptian mythology or the ancient inner African mythology. Now, Africa and Ethiopia in particular is that is that stone which the builders have refused, and it's becoming the head cornerstone because even many of them, the other Jews and, and Europeans and researchers who are honestly seeking for the truth, have to refer to this Ethiopic, this black, this inner African root. And it's been a long time in coming, and it's not us who have prevented them, but it's their own misleaders and false prophets and others among the so-called counterfeit Christians and the Jews who call themselves Jews who have misdirected their faithful followers to look away from the black when now we recognize the root of it is in the black or the African or the Ethiopia is that root. And this is what we mean when we speak about a Rastafari revelation, because only since the coming of the king of kings of Ethiopia, Kedamawi Haile Selassie or Haile Selassie the first, the last king of kings of Ethiopia, thus the Alpha and Omega, according to that parable, even in a parabolic interpretation or a mythological interpretation of his majesty, it also once again fulfills biblical prophecy, i.e. Revelation and the book of Daniel. So this is also another very important book here, Ethiopic Grammar by August Dillman, and we also have this available as well. This is a little more of a high school or college level material. We, we consider this as a high school. We won't suggest this as basic beginner information. Basic beginner information is the Fidel, the Hahu, the Amharic Bible homeschooling is what we would suggest to the, the neophytes or novices or newcomers who are not too familiar with the, the Fidels, the Ethiopic alphabet and, and, and the, and the um, language to be, get a better familiarity with the language. But as one grows, and matures, such documents as this is and will become vitally um, necessary. But as ones can afford it and are willing, we will suggest once you get a copy for themselves and their family, especially their children, you get to have a copy of this. This is a, this is a rare work and, and rarely published before and only seen in some of the higher so-called academic circles. And this is called Ethiopic um, Grammar. Um, by August, August Dillman, and we give a brief um, preface, a new preface in this, and say some words on this particular document as well. Now, what's in this particular Torah portion? This particular Torah portion, Vayera, Vayera, um, is Hebrew for, and he appeared, and he appeared. That's what Wayara, Wayara means, and he appeared. And, 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 and who appeared? Well, in order to understand this, or to gain a basic knowledge of this, because just because you know something doesn't mean you truly understand something. In fact, he's watching a program on um, off of PBS or the other night, and they're saying that scientists, or was it maybe a DVD, they're saying that, you know, scientists, they, they have this knowledge, they know these things, but they don't understand what they, what they all mean. And we thought this was one of the most amazing and interesting statements. 
that it's possible for all of these so-called bigger brains and intellectuals, mainly Eurocentric, even if they're in blackface, to have knowledge of all these things, but then, thankfully they admitted it, they don't understand what these things mean. So, that, so knowledge and understanding is not the same thing. So it begins with the word and understanding the word. And at, as, as ones begin discipleship and, and begin these studies or continue these studies with I and I, um, and this is why the rebirth, the new birth is so important. Because when his spirit starts to mingle with our spirit, when the Holy Spirit starts to mingle with our spirit, it enables us to look at ourselves honestly and say, wow, I always thought that was such and such, and, and I was wrong. You know, and, and, and we're, we're able to look at our wrongs without all this head trauma, because a lot of folks have a lot of head trauma when they are looking at their wrongs or, 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 or shortcomings. And here I want to introduce just briefly this particular book. Some of y'all might know it, some of y'all might not. They say don't judge a book by its cover or by its title. But um, it's called Sexual Secrets, Sexual Secrets. It's a tantric or some say, oh, this is Eastern philosophy, so forth and so on. Well, of course, the counterfeit Christians, and if you belong to that, that wugging, that sect, of counterfeit Christians, this book might offend some of your sensibilities, but it's mature. You understand? How did we all get here? Most of us are not test tube babies or, or aliens from some reptilian outer space race or something like that. You understand? So we all was born in that, in that natural God-given and God-ordained way. So there are sexual secrets. But in this book is not just about sex, and that's where a lot of people will look at this particular book and say, oh, sex, they're talking about sex, and maybe this will get your interest, and maybe that's how people will begin to grow, by their interest being piqued a little bit. But um, unfortunately, in counterfeit Christianity, these issues of sex, um, these basic life issues have not been dealt with, and this is probably why there's so much aberration an abomination today in the world with people exploring and, and saying they were born like this, born like that, and all this other kind of stuff. And these are heavily burdened souls. You understand? Know and, and many of them we're getting to learn um, were also violated. You know, when we learn about the real level of sex crimes, both in slavery and now as we see these other um, sex crimes. You know, the interesting thing about it is the person who does, like this coach, this is a little bit on the other side of it, but since we just reason, somebody that's in Dusky or whatever like that, and he's been molesting all these boys, is he gay? I mean, can we say he's gay? Those things, oh, we're not supposed to put those two things together. I just wonder, is he homosexual? Because gay is a euphemism. It means, it means happy. So, so there's a lot of, of wordplay and spells that are going on with that whole thing right there. But we have to begin with self-examination, and we wanted to touch on this point and have tried to touch on it here and there, but maybe we can use this opportunity right here in this particular sabbatical portion to just put this on the record. Self-examination. There's a chapter here on self-examination. Now, this book is, is from a tantric, or one can say an Eastern, uh, they say Eastern religion or Eastern spirituality, and some would say, well, that has nothing to do with the Bible. They, 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 they will put a wall up there, a wall that never existed, and say it has nothing to do with the Bible. Truth is truth is truth. Now, what's interesting is that even in these other religions or spiritualities, um, the idea of, of, of the Trinity and, and of a tripartite or triune God or origin is at the root. And the sister who had asked or had made some statements about our video um, concerning the turn to Christ and not a return of Christ. In other words, Christ says, I am with you always. So we either have to decide, is he with us or not? See, it's not about the return of Christ. If you would study, it's about the appearing of Christ. Now, this is where this Torah portion now comes into, into context. 
because Christ says he will appear. But Christ says that the kingdom of heaven is already here, but man walks up and down and he walks past it because he does not recognize or he does not physically see it. So now the devils and the deceivers have put out um, an antichrist philosophy, and they say seeing is believing. And many of y'all might think this actually makes sense. You say, of course, if you see it, then you believe it. That means you really don't understand what belief or true faith really is, and you've been deceived. Now, that might offend some of y'all, and a lot of folks, they are easily offended. That shows either you're not truly born again, or you're still at an immature level. You are not mature. You're still at a child level, so you must be um grown up or you must grow up into him in all things. So I says that the law or Torah is our schoolmaster so that we can grow up to him. You understand? In all things. So you have a lot of folks out there who said, I'm a Christian or even I'm a Rasta or I've been tried in this long or I've been such an, you know, they're, they're giving you their resume. You should ask, do you have that on a piece of paper? You know, can you give me that piece of paper, you know, what you've done and all these other sort of things. You know, let's talk about the truth, you know, and let's talk about the Bible. And it's amazing that a lot of Christians want to talk about Jesus but don't want to talk about the Bible. And that's what, you know, let's, let's, I mean, I'm supposed to trust you, and you saying you know this because somebody else either told you this or somebody was preaching on this and all of this, that person never met Jesus or the true real Christ but they know this from the Bible. So if the Bible is the source, let us deal with the Bible. And the Bibles that they had in Christ's time was OT or Old Testament, was Torah. So let's go to the very foundation. Now, here, I'm just going to give you this a little briefly because somebody had made a, we got a chance to look at some of the comments. Occasionally we're able to look at some of the comments. And even more, really, we're able to engage directly, I and I ourselves, some of the comments and give thanks to the brothers and sisters who also have some upful words to share with others and, and to also continue to gather, you know, ones and ones into reasonings and discussions on these particular points and teachings that um, this ministry and I, Wendem Yadin, have brought up. But the, um, the sister had... Um, she had, oh, no, not the, not the sister, it was actually, I think, 83 Leaf. Is that you out there? You're watching this? 83 Leaf? Um, that was kind of simple. I think that, that's what the, the handle, you know, YouTube's handle is. And we caught one of the spam messages. There was a spam message, and it said, oh, you want to see what it is? And it was, the message was spam, so we clicked on it. And they said, uh oh, this guy, he has a lot, he has knowledge, but he's kind of cocky, so forth and so on. And, you know, like, and it was just kind of interesting, uh, you know, and, and, and there was another message saying that he has knowledge but not too much wisdom. You know, he needs wisdom. He got a lot of knowledge but not wisdom. See, that's what a lot of folks say when what you know and what you proclaim has blown their make-believe out of the water. You see, because a lot of people, and they get offended. So they have to find something to convince themselves that, well, you, you're not perfect or something like that. You know, as though, and now they're judging. You know, now they're, they're not just judging, but they are seeking to condemn. But that didn't really offend us. So we said, you know, we want to make a little word, and what better time than, than, than the present. And we want to quote this. This is from the Tao or the Tao Te Ching. The, the Tao Te Ching. And the Tao Te Ching, a Chinese a philosophical work, of the 6th century B.C., before Christ, 6 centuries B.C., that's about like almost 600 to 700 years before the Common Era. There is a beautiful and clear statement about self-knowledge, about self-knowledge, true rebirth and being truly born again in the King of Kings and through his Christ, is about self-knowledge, and this word applies right here. The author, Lao Tzu, or Lao Shu, Su, Su, declares, knowing others leads to wisdom. What? Knowing others, not knowing yourself, but knowing others. If you observe and carefully analyze others in situations, 
that's why we can say a lot of older folks who never went to college or school and maybe could even read very well beyond a basic a basic um, childhood sort of level of reading, we would say, oh, grandma, great-grandma, grandpa, they had a lot of wisdom. Even though they couldn't read and maybe barely even write their name, but they had a lot of wisdom. How did they gain this wisdom? By osmosis? No, by knowing others. So knowing others leads to wisdom. But here's the key. Knowing the self leads to enlightenment. Knowing the self leads to enlightenment or to true illumination. Mastering others requires force. To master others requires force. Mastering the self calls for inner strength. Now, we thought this was interesting because in the world that we're living in today, these are two competing um, systems, one where people are seeking to master others by the use of force, whether they want to call it law and order or whatever like that, so forth and so on city, county, state regulations included. Um, but what the kingdom of the king of kings and his Christ, or Christ and his kingly character is about, and what this Rastafari revelation is about, is the second part of this, where it says mastering the self. Mastering the self. What discipleship is about is mastering the self. And this is where it calls for inner strength. Now, His Majesty, in his um, utterance on religion, also speaks of this spiritual strength and, but, and, and, and the connection with the calm. The, we need to have a calm in our inner beings. You understand know, that there needs to be a, a peace in our inner beings. And, and where's, that, um, where's that particular uh, uh, speech again of, of our Father? I think we had... We actually put it out, but it's in the new, it's in the new volume. Um, the Gospel of Him, we have a copy of the Gospel of Him. Bring the Gospel of Him on the table over there, the side tables, under some books on the side table over there. Can you bring that? Um, because the teaching of His Majesty on this particular point is, Miss Ghana, okay, the Gospel, and the, this is why we included some of these these uh, utterances of his imperial majesty because these utterances need to be um, repetitiously read as well as meditated upon. You understand? The, the meditation upon these um, teachings of his imperial majesty are very, very, are, ver are extremely important to us in our daily in our daily walk, but also in our in our spiritual in our spiritual um, growth in our spiritual growth. Now, in the speech on religion, in the speech of the King of Kings on religion, um, when he speaks about uh, that inner to acquire that absolute inner in in a in a calm within our soul. He is actually breaking down the the for lack of a better word, the metaphysical or to use a, a Christian a, a biblical reference, the the spiritual warfare that many of us have to go through in order to get to this point of acquiring that inner of acquiring that inner strength that inner strength. Now, there's much in here, and I don't know if, whether I can find this uh, this particularly easily right here. Oh, yeah, yes, we found this on page 46. You could, uh, um, thank you for your patience. It says, um, His Majesty, His Imperial Majesty speaks on the true religion. To make our wills obedient to good influences and to avoid evil is to show the greatest wisdom. In order to follow this aim, one must be guided by religion. Now, just to, the, the word religion is tricky because it's an it's a English concept. But before English was, the Ethiopic and the Amharic and those ancient roots 
were already. So the word that's usually translated in the Amharic for what in the English is religion. Now, religion comes from a different et et etymological root than the, the Ethiopic. So though we translate this in common terms like religion, it does not mean that from an Ethiopic mind or a Christ mind, it has the same um, etymological roots. In other words, religio means to hold back, tie down, so forth, and so on. But from the its Ethiopic root, the word will be hymenote, hymenote. And high, high means life, and ominote means faith or living, living faith, living faith. So let us understand that as, as we read over these teachings of his imperial majesty. So in order to follow this aim, one must be guided by quote, end quote, or quote, religion, end quote, but more correctly, hymenotes, or living faith. Progress without religion or living faith is just like a life surrounded by unknown perils and can be compared to a body without a soul. Knowing that material and spiritual progress are essential to man, we must ceaselessly work for the equal attainment of both. Only then shall we be able to acquire that absolute, what? Inner calm. He didn't say, well, first we need to solve peace in the Middle East, or we need to solve some other kind of crazy crisis that's going on, or the Taliban in Afghanistan, or, or some other kind of thing. Because ultimately, everyone needs to begin solving their own problem, and their, their, their first problem is getting over themselves and, and, and acquiring that absolute inner calm that's so necessary to our well-being. When conflict arises between material and spiritual values, the conscience plays an important role. So the conscience is as a, the Helena is as an, 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 a mediator, a mediator. And it says, anyone who suffers from a guilty conscience is never really free from this problem until he makes peace with himself and his conscience. His Majesty goes on to teach us that discipline of the mind is a basic ingredient of genuine morality and therefore of spiritual strength. So he tells us it all right there, that discipline of the mind is a basic, that means it's the basis, the maseret. It's Masaratawi, it's foundational ingredient of genuine of genuine morality, not pretense morality. Oh, I I I have some black friends or white friends, or I like everybody and just love and all that kind of no, that's pretentious, but genuine morality requires one having and gaining a discipline of the mind. This is what discipleship helps to establish and therefore of spiritual strength. Spiritual power is the eternal guide. That means both today, yesterday, and in the futures, tomorrow and beyond. In this life and the life after, for man ranks supreme among all creatures, led forward by spiritual power. Man can reach the summit destined for him by the great creator. Now, we can ask ourselves, what is this summit? Now, the summit is very clear in the teaching of his majesty as well as the testimony of our black Lord and Savior, Adonenu Yehoshua HaMoshiach of Jesus Christos. And that is the establishment as above, so below, or as in heaven on earth of Jah's will, of God's will, of the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is, this is real talk now. This is, this is real reasoning now. But we ourselves have to become acquainted and taught of the kingdom if we're to have any rightful role or responsibility or serviceability in that soon to be actually set up and established. We touched on that in the in the eleven eleven um series previously, I think it was the second or third part, 
where we was going on over the Schofield uh, um, um, study notes about the so-called end of the Gentile times, the end of the white supremacist time, and we made the connection about what you see going on with the debt crisis and the economics is a major and the civil so-called disturbances occupy Wall Street. People are beginning to so-called wake up, you understand, because they are feeling the direct effects. Unfortunately, they didn't have discipline of the mind to recognize it before it got so bad, but such is the nature of the human condition. So knowing others leads to wisdom, and knowing the self leads to enlightenment. Mastering others requires force. And that's easy, basically, when you think about it. If you want to be forceful and master others, that's easy. To do what the Babylonians do, you understand, to use force, fear, intimidate, intimidation, and even bloodshed and murder in order to um, downpress people. That's, that's, that's easy compared to the greater struggle, and that is mastering the self, because that calls for inner strength. Now, His Imperial Majesty's teaching on the living faith, on hymenotes, on religion, now gives us that instruction and that key. And furthermore, he, he, he points to the Bible as well as to the actualization of what we learn and we become convinced of, not just to have this as head knowledge, but to have it also as heart knowledge and to have it manifest in our works, in the works of our hands and what we do in the so-called real world that that is the real that is the real test that's the real touchstone so self examination is a touchstone and a support in life it strengthens the mental attitude necessary for self development because see, a lot of folks think that you know there's an easy shortcut there's really no shortcut shortcuts produce deep scars if you understand, shortcuts produce deep, that's like stabbing. That's what a short, let's have a stab at it. That's a shortcut, but it is, is a, is a, is a deep, a deep scar. A deep scar is produced from shortcuts. But self-examination is the touchstone, or we can even say the cornerstone and a support in life, both in this world and the world to come. It strengthens the mental attitude. There's a mental attitude that's necessary for self-development. So many ask, well, when we're going to have discipleship uh, callings or reasonings or certain gatherings, and we can also respond to you and say, as soon as we all demonstrate the mental attitude that is necessary, each of us individually has that primary response ability, has that as a primary responsibility. It is a very personal practice and should not be made a topic of general conversation for doing so results, they say, in psychic dispersion and weakened self-confidence. Self-examination, we're on the subject matter of self-examination, of examining oneself. It should not be a, 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 a general conversation. This is why even within the, the, the church or the community, there must be faith as a foundation, because it's not faith as a, the true faith as a foundation, as a practice. Ones will not be able to trust one another to say, go to a particular brother or sister, you understand, to discuss, like, like the Bible says right here, if we look at James, to show you, show you how the so-called metaphysical and even some of the tantric and the Gnostic teachings, if it's put into its proper context, is an expansion on the true trajectory and direction of the Bible and the Gospels in particular. But the counterfeit Christianity advocated and promoted by white supremacy has done overall much damage to that truth. It says right here, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Or this is James chapter 5, and we're at verse 15, which says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, 
and Adonai, the Lord, shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, or sin chatiat, they shall be forgiven him. It says, confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a sadic soul, or a righteous man, availeth much. Now, that is the truth. But unfortunately, we don't live in a world where manifest truth is the, is the usual, is the usual, it's not the status quo. You understand? The manifestation of, of the truth and righteousness, unfortunately, is not the status quo in present day 11, 11, 11. Not just America, but this whole global world system or system. But, unfortunately, this sort of practice is not even done in most church or religious um, gatherings or, you know, spiritual religious Because the people, thing people complain about, they say, is that if I tell somebody my fault, they're going to make it known to everybody. And, and we've seen examples of, of this happening. If I confess to, to this brother or this sister there, they're going to tell everybody else, even though I just told them, you know, and, and then people not praying for you, people looking down on you, people are not just even just judging you. They are seeking to condemn you as though they were given condemnatory authority and not following the clear dictates of the Scripture and the clear teaching of the Bible. But, my brothers and sisters, because it's not being done, you understand, here or there, it doesn't mean that we discard that truth, because that truth is still true. It just shows that ones need to live up, as Rastafari would say. They need to, to, to free up themselves. You understand? They need to free up themselves by self-examining themselves. And see, this is why studying Torah and studying the law is important. It says elsewhere in the Gospels that the law is our schoolmaster, but as Paul teaches in Romans, the, 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 the Word of God, it shows us where we're at. It shows us how much we are still in need of humility and in need of, of, of good work and, and, and developing a, a good attitude and praying for spiritual strength to overcome much of our own heavily burdened souls because there's many souls that are heavily burdened. This is why self-examination is a very personal practice, and those who they trust to confide or confess their faults should be and is required from, from Christ's perspective to be faithful and praying people, you understand, ones that truly have submitted to the will of God themselves. And this is the only way that it can and it will work. And though we haven't seen this as we should see this in the world, it doesn't mean that it will not be manifest. In fact, one thing that Christ, our black Lord and Savior, says is that when people say he returns, but really when he appears, this is the truth, when he appears or he reveals, he unveils himself. Remember, he says he's with us always, but Christians talk about the return of Jesus but then we read in the Bible, he says, I am with you always, and I have become a life-giving spirit. So is he with us or is he not with us? The truth is that it's not the return of Christ, but it's firstly that we must turn to Christ. And when it is full and when we have grown up, he will reveal himself. But he's here. He, he is here. Not no secret place. He is here in our hearts and in our minds, plain and simple. You understand? Now, those who need a fleshy manifestation of Jesus, well, according to Christ, he said to the disciples, you're not going to see me anymore. You understand? But then when we see the Father, we see him. Now, that's another area of prophecy that the counterfeit Christians haven't touched on, and that half of the story is contained in the revelation of his majesty or Christ in his kingly character, because in his majesty we are seeing that fulfillment of the prophecy of Christ that's contained in John chapter 16 concerning the fatherhood of God. Now, that's a related issue, but let's just get through this right here. So, 
positive self-examination and deepens the capacity for the intuitive experiences. It creates a state of enhanced receptivity. Now, the word receptive is Kabbalah or Kabbalah. The word Kabbalah in the Ethiopic is that root of what the Jews or certain Jews speak of as the Kabbalah. So please understand that. So they are talking about the Kabbalah as a system of, 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 of Jewish teaching, mysticism. But the word Kabbalah is that word receive. Now think about this. How many times did Christ say, if you can receive, and he used the word receive, and how many places in the Bible is the word receive used in its different forms? That the majority of these instances, if you get to the very root, the Ethiopic and even the Hebraic root, you will find the word kebele, which is the very root word, Kabbalah. Now, if you study these, you will understand what the true Kabbalah is all about. But by seeing ourselves in a clear light, we can eliminate negativity and doubt. See, still there is a lot of negativity and, 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 and doubt amongst not just others, but amongst all of I and I. So by studying and showing ourselves approved and growing up and, and, and praying, you know, and, and fellowshipping and, and doing those, those acts of both kindness and righteousness according to the teaching of His Majesty and the testimony of our Black Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is, is how we can eliminate that negativity and doubt and receive the clear illumination in our hearts and our minds. Now, this negativity and doubt, they tend to pollute our relationships. Most people say, oh, that one treated me wrong and this one did such and such. What most people who haven't self-recognized or self-examined themselves really don't recognize is what was their responsibility. You understand? They might not see that it's the negativity in their own hearts and minds and it's a doubt in their own heart and mind that contributed to the pollution of this or that relationship. This is not to say that perhaps the other person might have been more adversely um, um, negative in, in heart and mind or heavily burdened in their soul, but the important thing for you and me, for I and I, is that individually we get our spiritual house in order. This means each of I and I in this sense Rasta Fari or Rasta for I is important that we have to receive this for from an individual perspective first and foremost before we even start to think about community or, or, or gathering or, or anything else. We have to first of all humble ourselves and get our head and heart, our spiritual our, our, our house in order. We must get our house in order. Now, authenticity within the couple. Now, this is speaking to couples here. It forces spontaneity, thus liberating the relationship from the conventional and predictable. Invoke an earnest desire to know your true self. See, discipleship is not just about learning of biblical things and language and, and other important, very important subject matter. But really it's about knowing your true self because you first of all must deny yourself. That's, that's, that's what the master teaches. You understand? The master says you must deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. Do what? Must deny yourself. So think about how many times we are supposed to be in the spirit of God in Christ or Rastafari, and we're still thinking about our own ego, you understand, or being led by our own ego. And then when we look at the teaching of His Majesty and the testimony of Christ, our ego is not following the teaching or the testimony. And then when we see that, what do we do about it? We just say, oh, well, everybody does that. See, that's, that's part of the re reason why there's, there's still this, this grace period. Put aside 
self-doubt, and fears. Self-examination is a prerequisite of any practice of meditation. And we've been talking about meditation. We've been talking about prayer. We've been talking about the Lord's Prayer, our Father's Prayer, how we can further um, 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 ground ourselves, you understand, spiritually, as well as grow ourselves you understand, by the teaching of his majesty, by the Torah portion, reading the studies, so that we can come together, so that we can work together, so that we can build this society of his imperial majesty and build a true community that is true to the name and to the will of of his imperial majesty, Moa Anbesa Zemene Gede Yehuda Keramawi Hala Salase, Siyuma Egeziyavi Her Nugusa Negest, Ze Echop Iya. So self examination is a prerequisite of any practice of meditation. So when you meditate, what do you meditate on? Do you, do you look at yourself? Do you look at yourself in light of the Torah, in light of the law of God? in light of the, the Ten Commandments, for example. Now, people say, well, nobody's perfect. Yes, but see how imperfect we all are and how there is no hope of perfecting ourselves without that spiritual power, without acquiring that inner calm. And this is why we come right back to, or forward, rather, to being born again and to the basics of the Christ man or the Christian good news known as the gospel because they are the keys. It can be performed, meditation, self-examination at any time, and is an internal reflective process far removed from the mind's chatter and random thoughts. So what you do is still your mind. And, and these random thoughts, oh, I got to do this, uh, I got to such and such, oh, that person did this to me, oh, such and such. No, no, you calm yourself. You focus even on your breath and your breathing, you see. And those who have practiced this and have received even the first fruits, they know what the benefits of this, of, of meditation and true prayer really are. It really improves your groundation and even your ability to help others who seek to be helped. In other words, you'll be able to reach a lot of these folks that you want to reach once you first of all reach for the Savior and reach for the Word, you understand, and reach for the truth within yourself and discard and detach and, 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 and give up into the fire of forgetfulness all those other things that are not like Gitachin Namen Hanatachin Jesus Christos. Last part of this right here, well, there's a little bit more, but we're going to just try to wrap this up right here and go into Waiyara. Because remember, it says, and he appeared. This is connected how? Because it is a revelation we're speaking about. This appearance is a revelation. And as we continue with this, we're going to touch on Selassie by Abraham Beit, or the Trinity in the house of Abraham, where those three men or angels, whom one, it seems, in, the, in, in the, the first book of Moses, one appears to be the Lord. In other words, there were these three men, three angels, three messengers, and then two goes to Sodom, one stays behind, and this one now is referred to as the Lord or as Yahweh. And the connection with the Trinity in that particular in that particular um um story in the scripture is very important and I hope that this helps to answer some of the questions concerning Trinity that we want to touch on. And we have a good opportunity in this week's Torah portion, Waira or Tagelet or he was revealed to him, or it was revealed to him, this revelation. So examination or self-examination starts with the observation of one's relationship to the things and the events in the world. Try to view all experiences as connected to one another and to oneself. Notice the fine details 
and cultivate an inquisitive but but detached attitude. Well, I didn't even highlight this before, but it's, it's a very it's a very important um, point where it says to notice the fine details and cultivate an inquisitive but detached attitude. But detached attitude. This is this is very very important. You understand? Very very important. Be inquisitive, but the detached attitude gets you gets you out of out of um, um, false judgments and 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 prejudgments or prejudicial judgments and condemnatory sort of judgments. Examine whatever comes to you and try to understand or overstand, if you please, the causes behind each situation and your actions in it. A simple procedure for self-examination is to sit comfortably in front of a mirror. They suggest this, but, you know, we'll, we'll share this with you. Sit comfortably in front of a mirror. Close your eyes and empty your mind of all thought. It's a little bit, and not more difficult, but it's, it's challenging, but it's a good experience to, 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 to do this. Then gradually begin to open your eyes, look at the reflection in the mirror as if meeting that person for the first time. See what sort of impression you make on yourself. Gradually notice, uh, or, or it says, says now, n notice how, excuse me, I skipped over a line, notice how changes in your facial expressions how changes in your facial expressions are linked to thoughts and emotions. <laughs> I'm just laughing for a moment while I'm thinking when I was young, I had did this one time. I'm sure we all did this. Well, maybe many of us did this. You would look in the mirror and you just look at yourself and keep looking at yourself until you, you don't recognize who you're seeing. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. It happened to me when I was very young. It's almost like you, you begin to see the difference between the inner spirit, the spiritual part, and this vehicle or vessel, you understand, this, this carbon organic structure. You begin to see the difference and say, what? and it gets scary to some folks. Well, some folks say, well, uh, I, I don't like that experience, you understand, because they were used to defining themselves by the outer by the so-called, quote, man in the mirror instead of the inner man who inhabits the man looking in the mirror. Gradually enter into rapport with your mirror image, gently relaxing your face while maintaining conscious control of breathing. If you notice negative qualities in your reflection, make a careful adjustment of attitude and emotion, using the breath to stabilize the psyche. And, you know, a whole lesson can be and should be done on that. Because actually when we speak about the name, um, um, the tetragrammaton or the name of Jehovah and the Hebrew Yahweh, and we get to the very root of it, it has to do with breath. It has to do with the breath of life. It has to do with breathing. And it's interesting how um, certain breathing techniques can help to really calm and stabilize and, and, and helps one to establish that, 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 that in a calm or peace, or at least a foundation for it, as it says right here, using the breath to stabilize the psyche. What is the psyche? The psyche is part of the trinity in man. The trinity in man, what is the trinity in man? Well, Thessalonians touches on it, but I will re refresh your memory. It is the spirit, the soul, and the body. That is the trinity in man. And the soul in the Greek is called suke. From the word suke, we get the modern um, clinical term psyche. Imagine that you are replacing a negative quality with a positive one. This is interesting because his majesty teaches, and I know I've, I'm, I'm always testifying or seeking to always testify to the truth of his majesty, but his majesty did say this, and you can search this out for yourself. He says that, um, uh, a bad habit, and I'm paraphrasing, a bad habit once, um, uh, once is formed, 
um, it becomes like uh, um, a bad habit that's once formed becomes um, it, it almost becomes like such an automatic behavior, the only way to overcome like a a bad habit, in other words, is to replace it by a good habit or something that is by comparison or in relation better. It's like if you always say something negative to someone that you probably shouldn't, then when you are in meditation thinking on that, try consciously with relaxed breath to replace the negative, and even if you slip and you say it, apologize and replace the negative with the positive. Imagine that you are replacing, it says right here, a negative quality with a positive one. Well, as Matthew said, that becomes like uh, um, incurable second nature, that a bad habit once formed becomes as an incurable second nature. And the only way to overcome that is to replace the bad habit with uh, a good a good habit, you understand, or in other words, with something that is better or positive, and try to feel that the new you, the new you is what the Bible talks about, the old man being being mortified or put to death, and the new one coming about through that new birth, you understand, and the first level is that being as a child again. Feel the new you as real and lasting. Then gradually close your eyes and concentrate on assimilating the experience, on, on eating and digesting. Or mawahad. Mawahad is the root of tawahido. Tawahido, as we say, the Ethiopian tawahido, when tawahido means to be made one. So assimilation is like what goes on when you eat food. And, and the food becomes part and parcel of your physical structure. You are assimilating the food and the nutritious and the nutrient ingredients. So now you have to also concentrate on a